welcome everyone. Thank you for joining. This is a very special webinar we're hosting. And I will introduce Dr. Zucker. He is infectious disease physician and the first LGBTQ fellow at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. And I will let him take it from here. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me today. Um, actually, before uh, the guys, and especially Omer from Osmosis, was, were inviting me, I just told them that I didn't know a lot about Osmosis and I didn't know it's a, such a big thing. So and uh, now seeing people from all over the world uh, taking part in this webinar, for me, it's kind of like heartwarming thing because um, I'm always glad and excited to talk about LGBT medicine uh, and bring, bring it all over the world. So, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm Roy. I'm an infectious disease physician, like Omar said, and I'm doing the first LGBT medicine fellowship at Mount Sinai in New York. This is a program that's going to continue after me. I'm finishing it actually in a month from now, uh, going back to Israel, where I'm from originally, um, and start to create something big, hopefully in Tel Aviv too, later on. And today, um, we're going to talk briefly about LGBT medicine. What is LGBT medicine? Why do we need a specific medicine for uh, LGBT people or LGBTQ people? Um, and what are the different needs of this population? Uh, and we'll talk about also a bit about uh, the major disciplines which are involved in this area. And we'll dig a, a bit into a you know, a specific areas where I can give you some examples of the different problems in the specific disciplines. And so you will get it a bit. Uh, and we'll talk a bit about the future. Um, and at the end, we'll give you some time for questions. Uh, Omar will kind of like pick them up. Um, so let's start. So first of all, I want to talk just for a minute about the, in, like, the first time an LGBTQ patient is arriving to your clinic, to a provider clinic. And this is kind of like a very important thing because sometimes even the most symbolic, very small thing of just putting the LGBTQ flag, which you can see on your left in your clinic or uh, where you treat a patient can actually give him the feeling of a safe environment, a place that he can actually have an open talk about everything. Uh, and it's a really great start, even if you are as a provider not knowing all the details, uh, it just means that you are willing to hear. And this is kind of like the first thing that is important because you are willing to learn more. And this is kind of a great beginning. Uh, and that's why I'm here today also for you. The other thing is pronouns, uh, and we do know that this, change, this thing is changing during time. And today in New York, for example, one of the first things we will ask our patient is which pronouns does he want us to refer to as? Uh, is it he, him, she, her, or they, uh, which is sometimes uh, especially non-binary people, sometimes transgender people will prefer uh, the pronouns they or them. Um, and this is also something when you are not so much uh, kind of uh, under, like when you're not sure how to refer to your patient, the best way is actually to ask him, her, they, uh, because they will tell you practically and they will also kind of respect it that you actually ask them and not taking things in for granted. Uh, so those are very like two small things that you can do for your future clinic, if I may talk about that. And now I'll talk about why do we need LGBT medicine? And why is it like something that needs to be done on a separate uh, field? When I'm saying LGBT medicine, it doesn't mean that as a primary care provider or as a family medicine uh, physician or as an other provider, you should not take care of LGBTQ people or you kind of like should refer them directly to a, you know, to a physician who just take care of this community. It means that um, you are as a physician, as a family medicine physician or as a primary care provider, you should know the basic stuff and you should know exactly what we talked about before. But if there are things that are going wrong a bit or if there are things that are more complicated, 
there will always be this person who can integrate everything together. And we'll talk about the different disciplines and I'll give you some examples. And it all starts from the point that when people are asking me, some people are saying, we wish to come to the day that we wouldn't need LGBT medicine because what's the problem? They are just like us. There is no problem. Everything is perfect, right? So even in a perfect world, as I see it, the world today, and you might know it as a providers or as a future providers, you might know it that the world is going for personalized medicine. And people want to get um, the med- like, like the treatment they have in the most accurate way. And for having that, it's not just about disparities and other things that we are going to talk about, but it's also about getting a better treatment when you know the patient, his culture, his different needs, different things that are very specific to him, her, um, it's, it's, it makes medicine much better. Having said that, the world is far from being perfect today, uh, as you might know or not know. And I see uh, people from all over the world here. So you might know that there is so much difference between different countries today about LGBTQ acceptance. Um, So we know that LGBT individuals face the health disparities linked to social stigma, discrimination, and denial of their civil and human rights. Uh, We know that LGBT people may face barriers to accessing healthcare uh, on the basis of their sexual orientation or gender identity or expression. Many avoid or delay Uh, their care or receive inappropriate inferior care. And this is something that we see a lot. People are getting to see medical care just at the minute they really need it and not before, not even talking about prevention and stuff like immunization and all kind of like screening tests and stuff. Um, Also, um, we know that when we, we take a look about on research and stuff, there is always a lack of epidemiological studies Uh, that have not been incorporated the sexuality. So this is another thing. Um, And generally, we can know that usually in a lot of studies, we can show it quite clearly that LGBTQ people just get a poorer health. uh, And and it may come to the point that they have many more comorbidities because of that. And sometimes because they have their own background, like, for example, HIV or other stuff, um, sometimes uh, it's all, it all comes together uh, and this is kind of an important issue to uh, attack. When I see LGBT medicine fellow or LGBT, someone who did LGBT medicine, so I, I was doing a lot of LGBT medicine before in Israel. So uh, I was one of the people who runs the LGBT clinic in, in Tel Aviv uh, and I did a lot of community stuff. Um, but, and I did my infectious diseases and internal medicine, but doing my fellowship, as I see today, this is much more about leadership. Uh, this is more, much more about community involvement. And of course, being the source of knowledge and kind of the ambassador of this thing called LGBTQ medicine, which means that if there is, like I told you, this physician, this primary care provider who is not sure what to do about his patient because he has all kind of things together, we'll give an example in a minute, I will be kind of like the place where he can approach to to ask those questions and hopefully we'll get the answers too. Um, But it's also about trainings and it's also about creating new programs for LGBT medicine, et cetera, et cetera. Um, These are the main different disciplines that I thought about uh, talking like you know, uh, that are relevant, infectious diseases, endocrinology, more in the hormone part, uh, urogynecology, addiction medicine, which is very important. And we see uh, that LGBT people are using sometimes uh, more drugs and specific drugs, sometimes different kind of drugs. Geriatrics, we need to understand that the LGBT population is getting older and older. And especially people, for example, who are living with HIV, who did not survive in older days, now they, they have a, you know, a totally normal lifespan and they have this PTSD f- with their life and all their friends who died and now they are getting to their 70s, sometimes their 80s. And I see here so many patients who have those crazy stories, but today they are 80 and they, they are living with HIV. 
but they they carry a lot of like you know a, a lot of baggage with them let's say um and adolescence medicine is also an important thing because today we know that things are starting earlier also being like decided deciding about your sexuality deciding about your gender identity etc so i want to give you an example for something which might look uh, a bit like mixing of everything but you you wouldn't believe how much it's happening actually so this couple their name is dan and tom um i'm this picture i don't know i just took it from somewhere i hope like um <laughs> it wouldn't go anywhere um and tom and dan are together for kind of like seven years now they got married six years ago um and they have a story uh and their story is kind of um so they are in an open relationship which is something that might be very common in the gay community also in a heterosexual community but it is very common in the gay community um so tom is suffering a bit from depression um he has some issues of sexual dysfunction um while uh, dan had a previous sti like sexual transmitted infections in the past you know they are in open relationships so things happen um he also used some gym enhancements um uh, like steroids and testosterone uh and they are this concord discordant couple i don't know if you know what is that but discordant couple is is a couple where one of the persons is hiv positive and the other is negative uh and this is happens quite a lot these days uh, and you know um it's also an issue when a patient or this couple is coming to you and ask you okay so what can we do can we do we have to use condoms all the time do can we uh, not use condoms etc etc you also are thinking you know they are still in open relationship and stuff but but still they are thinking about children in the future so uh they uh, also are starting to explore surrogacy having a child and all those things together they are coming as a couple to my clinic and they are asking all all those questions for example what about our hiv situation i'm positive he's negative what about our drug use uh is uh, dan drug use and is him being like hiv positive um is there are there any interactions between the drugs he taking parties once in a while and the hiv medications uh what about uh previous stds and and how should you screen them is it just enough to do a urine test or should you do more tests for chlamydia and gonorrhea for example um and there are so many other questions regarding their screening and stuff and all those questions usually when you will come just to a primary care who doesn't know a lot about lgbt people he might have some problems addressing all the questions and giving all the answers Uh, and it's fine because it's it's very niche sometimes but the niche is getting bigger and bigger um on the other hand we can talk about electra uh, from pose for example as an example for transgender woman uh so electra was born as a male but she is now uh she you know um her gender uh, identity now is female um she also had surgery or she is asking for surgery and there are a lot of questions that needs to be asked because except of that she is hiv positive also uh she has some issues with crystal matthews in the last few years uh also we see a lot of psychiatric problems sometimes and especially bipolar disease i see it a lot here in new york um and this is another issue and you know also other stuff like abnormal pap smear anal pap smear and i don't know if you know but anal pap smear exactly like cervical pap smear is a big issue especially now in the US we see that it might be a great way to prevent uh actually anal cancer by just screening for that exactly like you screen for HPV and cervical cancer in with, for, for just uh cisgender women so um all of those together and of course hormone therapy and her exploring uh further surgeries and stuff and all those questions needs to be asked and you know you can kind of like start sending for each discipline you know send her to her hiv physician then to her endocrinologist 
than um, to psychiatrists for every small problem. But the main idea is to go back and look at things more holistically, like, um, and most of the things can be addressed if you just learn them, you know, and you learn the basics and how to do it. For example, starting hormone therapy, it's not a, I can tell you, it's not a rocket science. It sounds very uh, complicated, but actually it's not so much. So, um, so it's just a matter of wanting to actually do it uh, as, a, as a provider. And of course, fertility, uh, which is also an issue that we talk about with our patients. Uh, I'll go over that, so we'll have some time. And if we go by the letters, uh, so we spoke about a, a bit about gays, we spoke about um, transgender women, uh, but we should remember also, for example, yet lesbian women who are kind of like we know that they have, they are doing much less breast, breast cancer prevention and screening, uh, much less cervical cancer prevention and screening. They suffer more from obesity and uh, low fitness. Uh, they are suffering from more domestic violence and substance abuse. Um, and this is one of the main issues because actually in my daily life, in my LGBT medicine fellowship and in my you know, daily routine, I almost don't see lesbian women. They are just not coming usually. And this is kind of like the main obstacle because when you're not coming to the clinic, you won't check yourself also. And the main work on the lesbian community, as I see it, is more about working on campaigns for coming for screenings. The screenings that every woman should do, but lesbian women are doing much less. And this is something very important to remember also as a future providers. Um, bisexual is actually a very uh, interesting to see, uh, concept to see in, or population to see uh, in research, because when they feel always, you know, caught in the middle, sometimes they don't want to be addressed as part of the LGBTQ people. Sometimes they, um, they are, but eventually what we see in studies that they are kind of like having the worst disparity, sometimes worse than even transgender people. And with transgender people, we are talking about sometimes 40% in some countries, 40% suicidal attempts. And with bisexual people in some countries, we see almost the same numbers, not talking about also like mental health and substance abuse and body image disorders. All of those things we see also in bisexual, uh, uh, in the bisexual community. And this is, you know, always the hardest community to address to because Again, they have to come to the clinic. You have to make them feel comfortable. And sometimes they won't feel so comfortable being in a clinic where everything is like so uh, gay, let's say, or, you know. Um, we talked a bit about transgender people and gay men. And so, so of course, there are some, some issues and I'm not going to continue with what's here because practically it's the same. And we'll just dig in into some examples. Um, and this is just the tip of the iceberg um, of talking about small things in hormone therapy and PrEP. I don't know if you know PrEP, but we'll talk about it really uh, short, in short uh, period. STIs, uh, HPV and uh, high resolution anoscopies, HIV, vaccinations, harm reduction. So all of, their, all of those are just the tip of the iceberg of what I'm doing on my daily life. Uh, with my patients and kind of like integrate it all together. Um, and one of the main things I like to do the most is in 2018, I started this big campaign. And from there, we started doing a lot of like community stuff regarding harm reduction to drugs in Israel, at least. And I'm sure it happens in some BO countries too. When people are using drugs, this is the thing you don't talk about. And even if you come to your physician and I want even to talk about it. He will say, uh, uh, no, no, this is illegal. I don't want to talk about it. Let's move on. And actually I see it as a really big missed opportunity because when you can talk openly about the drug use as a patient, when you can talk openly about your drug use, it's kind of like an opportunity to make you learn how to do it better. And also talking about other things, because usually when you do things when you open, when you're openly talking with your 
you know, with your physician about uh, things and your physician is willing to hear it, it's kind of like creating a great conversation about other stuff also. And the patient feels really comfortable with that. Uh, and with that, we did a lot of stuff. There are a lot of drugs. I'm not going to get into it because this is an hour and a half of a lecture. And if uh, Osmosis wants to kind of like do a lecture about drugs and harm reduction, uh, I will do it gladly. Um, but just to know that, you know, we did a lot of campaigns and stuff regarding uh, parties and how to do drugs better, how not to end up in the hospital uh, and even kind of like giving lectures to the authorities, to the police, to uh, attorneys, uh, showing them like, what is my perspective as a physician who doesn't want his patients to, you know, end up in the hospital and, and by telling him what he can do, what he cannot do, what he can mix and what he cannot mix together, you are actually saving lives like that. So first of all, it needs to be your kind of like uh, willing to know more about those drugs because it's very easy to say, I just don't know about it and that's it. But it's very challenging to actually know about it uh, and not just throwing your patient away and saying, oh, I don't know a shit about that. That's, you know, just like, don't do it. That's bad. Uh, of course, this patient will do it and, and you didn't help him at all. Um, and, and a big thing we did is a thing called Party Keepers. This is a course, a four-hour course with the EMS, with the Emergency Medical Services, which actually gives tools to people who are gay people in the gay scene who are actually going to parties and tell them how they can help their friends in an overdosing situation, just not to feel so helpless and, and kind of like, what is the time you should call actually the emergency medical services and how you should report them about this thing. Uh, and this created a beautiful uh, um, group of people who are actually coming to the parties as a party goers. And when they come to the party as party goers, if something happens, they actually help. And we did a research about it and it's just going to be published, I hope soon. Uh, we showed that we, they all fill the questionnaires and it showed that it's not just that they helped others, but it also helped them moderate their use. And this is kind of like a great, um, you know, example for an intervention, which is uh, kind of like a community on a community level and not just individual level. So uh, that's party keepers. This is some lectures. This is the mixing table we created. I created it in 2018 for Pride in Israel. And it shows you like mixing. I just took the different drugs that usually are being used in the gay scene. Sometimes in the heterosexual scene, the drugs are a bit different and, and, and there needs to be some adaptations. But in the gay scene, those are the things that usually are being used in the parties. And we kind of like gave it grades, like what is a low risk for synergy or like mixing and what is like super dangerous. Don't ever do that. Like GHB and alcohol, for example. This is a big no-no. Uh, so just for, as an example. So this was about drugs. And I want to talk a bit about PrEP, another concept which is very important because this is the closest thing we have today uh, before having a vaccine for HIV. This is actually a pill, an antiretroviral pill that you take on a daily basis. And if you take it on a daily basis, according to the CDC and according to what we know, it actually prevents 99%, it prevents HIV 99% of the cases, uh, which is actually almost 100% if you take it precisely on a, on a daily basis. And this is kind of like created a, a revolution in the way we think about HIV, uh, because we saw before PrEP was introduced in 2012, um, before that, condoms were already started. There was the condom fatigue era where people started to take their condoms off because HIV wasn't deadly as it was, but still kind of like, you know, people just told themselves, okay, I'll, you know, if I will have HIV, it won't be the end of the world but I cannot do it with condoms. I hate condoms. I feel not comfortable with them. Uh, I can't get to erection because of condoms. And when PrEP was introduced, it, all, it might accelerate a bit the decrease of condom use, but it just started, it just accelerated an existing uh, thing that happened also before, 
And of course, with that, we see an increase, a big increase in other STIs with gonorrhea and chlamydia and mycoplasma genitalium and, and, and syphilis. Uh, but PrEP actually made, for example, in New York, it made a revolution in the numbers of new infections every year. And we see, we see it drop dramatically. Every year we see the drop in, in New York and in New York it started in 2012. And we see it more and more. The, one of the biggest problem is that today prep is we we prep is not coming to the people who really needs it. And according to the CDC, actually the CDC says that 1.2 million people in the U USA, in the United States, needs to have prep, while only 150,000 people actually having it. And this is because of you know, um, and we see that people who are men of color or are from you know, low socioeconomical areas or from specific places like Texas or something, or, and not like where I am now in the middle of Chelsea, they are not really want to identify as gay men, having sex with men, and they don't want to take PrEP because it's like saying I'm gay or uh, saying in some places, at the beginning at least, people who used PrEP were kind of like, uh, they were called PrEP whores, uh, because kind of like it made it made them look more promiscuous. Today, it's uh, it really changed in the last few years, uh, and we almost don't see it anymore. At least not in uh, civilized areas and 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 like Western places. And uh, this is just uh, I want have time for that, so I'll skip it. Um, we do have to remember that uh, there is a big thing called ending the epidemic of HIV. Uh, and we see uh, uh, there, is, there are some goals, it's called the 90-90-90 goals that we want to, uh, you know, diagnose as much as we can. We want to treat as much, as much as we can, 90% of the people, and we want 90% of the people to be undetectable. Uh, we'll, if we'll have time, we'll talk about it later. Another very big issue is vaccinations. Uh, so there are specific vaccinations that people from the LGBT community, and especially people, gay men and bisexual men or men who have sex with men needs to have. One of them, for example, is, of course, human papilloma virus vaccine, which today we know that is beneficial to have it until the age of 45 even. It's better doing it when you are getting like, like when you are younger, but probably there's a benefit of doing it even after that, until the age of 45. Um, also hepatitis B, and hepatitis A uh, are very, very important. Uh, each one of them, you know, the just about the transmission. So HBV, hepatitis B is just being transmitted like HIV in sexual intercourse uh, with penetrations and stuff. And HAV, like hepatitis A uh, uh, virus, is being transmitted by fecooral um, uh, transmission. And in the gay scene or in MSM sex, usually, uh, there is something called rimming, which is kind of like a fecal oral uh, transmission. So uh, we saw in Israel, we saw also here in New York, there were some epidemics of hepatitis A, uh, you know, virus among the gay population. And it's very easy to prevent it. And it's all that it takes is just having the vaccine. And this is something that as a care provider, you don't need to be an LGBT medicine fellow or kind of like a, a genius or an ID physician to know that these are the basics, basic vaccines. Um, so the vaccine for human papilloma virus is called Gardasil 9, and it actually covers the most common and the most dangerous ones. Nine species out of like more than 150 uh, overall species that are existing. Um, and, guard, and, and actually, uh, the most dangerous ones are, of course, HPV-16 and HPV-18, who are kind of uh, the major cause for cancer for H caused by HPV, not just cervical, but also anal uh, and also oral cancer. So, um, you know, you have a vaccine, and this is one I'm always saying, it, saying that, Practically, this is one of the only or if not the only vaccine that actually prevents cancer, if you think about it. So make sure as a future providers that your patients have this vaccine. Um, we do know that in the last years, there's a big trial going on in the United States and in Europe called the ANCOR trial. 
which actually check if it is cost beneficial to do, uh, like I told you before, a pap smear, an anal pap smear uh, for men who have sex with men, exactly like uh, women are doing cervical cancer screening. And this study actually takes people, some of them are being checked uh, and treated, some of them are not, and it kind of like needs to show that it's a huge trial, so it, it takes a lot of time for the results to come. But the main idea is to show if you actually prevent cancer by screening for NL, uh, NL pap smear. Uh, here in, the New, in New York, it's covered by the insurances and HIV patients are doing NL pap smear every year. And if it's abnormal, you usually go for HRA for a, you know, a anoscopy, a high resolution anoscopies. And if you need to, you're kind of like a, a get it burned before it comes to the point that it becomes cancerous. So the main idea is to find it before uh, in the precancerous uh, stage practically. Um, talking about sexual transmitted infection, Another big issue that I dealt with a lot in Israel, but I'm always surprised to see how much that it, it's happening also here in the middle of New York, in the most you know, Western place that knows everything, goes by the CDC, and still how screening for STDs, especially chlamydia and gonorrhea, is not done well for MSM, for men who have sex with men. And one of the main things I want you to learn from this session today is actually you should remember that chlamydia, gonorrhea, and also mycoplasma genitalium, who is their you know, friend also, uh, kind of transmitted in the same ways. And they are site-specific. What does it mean? That you can get them in the place where you use the, like, you know, where you had sex, if it was an oral sex, the chlamydia or the gonorrhea can stay there. Actually, chlamydia in the throat is more is rare, but gonorrhea for sure. Uh, and if you did anal sex, you will find your chlamydia and gonorrhea in the anus. And if you did, you know, and if you did it like, you know, used your, you know, penis, for example, so it might be there. Um, but actually the main idea is that checking just for urine tests for chlamydia and gonorrhea for men who have sex with men, is almost like doing nothing because most of the infections will, will not be in the urine if the patient is asymptomatic. And we should remember that for chlamydia and gonorrhea, more than 50% of the cases, sometimes more, will be asymptomatic. And you need to kind of like check for it, screen for it, and treat it in order it not to, you know, get complicated individually, but also not to infect others. Um, and that's why for men who have sex with men, the guidelines say that you need to do a triple site testing or three site testing, oral, rectal, and urine test. And if you don't do the three of them, you are missing a lot of infections. And actually, if you need to skip one of the, those three tests, the one you can skip in asymptomatic patients, MSM, uh, is actually uh, the urine test, which sometimes this is the first thing you give to your patient. Um, and actually a study we did about it in Tel Aviv, uh, for me, it was in a time when the, you know, the uh, health maintenance services in Israel did not allow for pre site testing. So I kind of created this um, trial or this research in my center, in my health center uh, in Tel Aviv. And we just call people who are men who have sex with men. If you are sexually active, just come and check yourself. And, and they did three site testing. And we saw that out of um, 230 people that took part in this study, um, only two of 230 people had a positive urine test, while overall, more than a third of the people were positive for something, either chlamydia or gonorrhea, but most of the infections were either in the oral or rectal uh, areas. Uh, and the numbers were sky higher in, uh, for PrEP users. For PrEP users, it was 48%. For 48% of the people who came to be tested from the PrEP group were positive for chlamydia and gonorrhea. Uh, and this is mainly because also those people were not checking themselves before because you couldn't check it in, 
Israel back then. So if you don't check it, you don't find it. The physician or the provider thinks everything is fine. He gave, gave you his urine, the urine test. You did it. It was negative. You think you're fine, but you keep infecting others. And this is kind of like a vicious circle of infections. And this is why STIs are getting higher and higher in numbers. And uh, that's a big issue that I want to stress here in this kind of, you know, if we talk about the different uh, small things in LGBT medicine that needs to be taken care of. Uh, so treat site testing for STIs is one hell of a big thing. Um, so HIV, um, I'm going to talk a bit about HIV. We talked about the 909090, um, the UNI-8 and the WHO came uh, to the point that they want, it was until 2022, every year it's kind of like being delayed. But the main goal is to make sure that 90% of the people who are living with HIV will know about it, will know their status. 90% of the people who are HIV positive and knows about it will be uh, taking their antiretroviral therapy. And 90% of them will uh, actually uh, be virally suppressed with undetectable viral load. And today, um, it's a nice thing because people are living with HIV quite okay and very okay actually if they take their medications so we have the fourth 90 which is 90 percent of the people are healthy and living a healthy aging for people living with hiv meaning like they can just live their life and you should take care about their other comorbidities like uh, diabetes like blood pressure and other stuff that we might see more in this population um, a big big issue that i want to stress again is the U equals U. So if you remember, we talked about Dan and Tom, and they were discordant couples, which means that Dan is HIV positive and Tom is HIV negative. Now Dan is undetectable. And they came to my clinic and they say, oh, for years, what we are doing is I don't want to use PrEP and, and we are just using condoms. And today we know for sure that U equals U. And this is something that um, is being on the press for a long time now. Undetectable equals untransmissible, which means that if you are HIV positive and you are undetectable, there is no, no way that you can transmit the virus to anyone. And this is kind of one of the only things in medicine that we can say in 100%, just because the study was so huge and it checked for 1,500, I think now it's more, it's a, a study called the partner study. And it looked for, you know, uh, people who are discordant couples. Uh, and it just checked if they got infected by one another. And out of those 1,500 people who were kind of like, you know, under surveillance for a few years, and they kind of counted their almost 80,000 sexual intercourses. And out of those 80,000 sexual intercourses between these four and couples, how many infections were there? Zero, zero. So we don't see zero in medicine. I don't know um, if, if you uh, encounter so many zeros in medicine because it's not math, it's not mathematics. Uh, and this is one of the only things we can say for sure. If you are undetectable, you cannot transmit your virus. And this is something I'm stressing to my patients all the time. Having said that, we should always remember that this is aimed for couples. When someone is just meeting someone after being in a, you know, a, a dating app uh, and he tells him I'm undetectable, you cannot for sure count on it, of course, because you don't know this man, you don't know if he's really undetectable. So you need to know that this person is undetectable. So you need to kind of like be in a trusting position. And that's why doing the same with just someone you just met on an app, on a dating app or, a, you know, grinder for us gays, um, it's not enough. Uh, so that's important thing. Uh, this is the um, study in the Lancet uh, that was called the partner study. And you are more than welcome to read it. It's a very interesting one. Um, just the, the last uh, three minutes, I'm going to talk about transgender care. Um, and we should remember that 0 0.6, this is approximately in the world, it's changing, but it's between 0 0.5 to 0 0.8% uh, uh, of the population 
identify as a transgender. Um, and it doesn't mean that all of them are having surgeries, by the way. Most of them do not have surgeries. Some of them and have like hormone, like are taking hormone therapy. Um, we should remember that we start hormone therapy, the real hormone therapy, estrogen and or testosterone um, after puberty. And for, for you know, a transgender adolescents, uh, we usually start with GRH agonists, um, which are kind of, uh, you know, just delaying puberty. Um, but this is still reversible, but you can start actually the process and it's better kind of starting it if, you know, the, it's always kind of a debate about what is the right age to start it. And it's, there's a debate between countries also, very civilized countries like Sweden that just now announced that it, it does not allow that while the US does allow it. So there, there's, there are a lot of issues there. Um, and of course, uh, for transgender women, usually uh, we give uh, estrogen-based hormones. And of course, there are others um, blockers like spironolactone. Uh, for transgender men, usually we give testosterone. You should remember transgender women are, uh, you know, a transgender woman was born as male, like with a male uh, genitalia but identified as women. And we want to kind of like align between the, you know, um, between the feeling and the, you know, the gender uh, they were born with. Um, and of course, talking about transgender people uh, and the transgender community is another big topic, another hour. Again, if you want, they can come. Uh, gladly to talk about it. There's a, you know, a separate lecture for that. Um, and there is a New England Journal of Medicine uh, that was done by Mount Sinai, by the way, uh, by Mount Sinai professor who is, uh, you know, the uh, director of the program here called Josh Safer. Uh, and it's called Care of Transgender Persons. It's from two years ago. And I really, really um, call you to... Uh, read it because it's very basic and it gives you the main idea and it's really helpful it's like when i read that i oh my god like for two years i'm trying to struggle three years i'm trying to struggle with this like how do you give the hormones what times how do you do the follow-ups and stuff and everything is written very very easily and you can understand just from this paper that it's not a rocket science so um i would suggest that um and of course, today we see more and more people who are identifying themselves as non-binary. Now, this is kind of like thing that I'm trying to figure out with myself also because it's a mixture of a cultural thing and also gender identity. And people can, you know, can address themselves as a third gender, trigender, bigender. They're, it's, it's kind of like, you know, it's not a binary thing. So people can be in this sphere somewhere they pick to be. Uh, and that's fine. And we endorse that. And we just want people to feel comfortable with themselves. Um, and you should remember that most of the things, even hormone therapy is mostly reversible. The surgeries are less reversible. Um, but yeah, it's a huge topic also. Um, I want to end just with something I always like to end my lectures with. Um, it's a it's a, actually an article called The Epidemic of Gay Loneliness. And I really um, I think that if you didn't read it so far, uh, you should. Uh, but I just want to read something from this article, which I always kind of, um, you know, like to read it. Uh, so for gay people, we've always told ourselves that when the AIDS epidemic was over, we'd be fine. Then it was uh, when we can get married, we'll be fine. Now it's when the bullying stops, we'll be fine. We keep waiting for the moment we feel like we're not different from other people. But the fact is we are different. It's about time we accept it and work with it. And I think this is a very important message to you also because it's fine for us, it should be fine to be different. Being different is not a, you know, it's not a bad thing. It's not something uh, which, you know, should make your life harder. And, um, and it's the same with medicine. We need to know that the LGBT population has its needs 
and we need to address them and, and let's work on that. Um, and that's it practically. I hope like in these 40 minutes, I started that, like, you know, it's a first glance, um, but I hope you learned at least, you know, the main things I wanted to um, bring up and let's go for the questions. Awesome. So thank you very, very much for your time. Uh, we have many, many questions. I know this is a very, very interesting and new topic for most of us, I think, or for at least some of us. We won't be able to go through all of them. Uh, but as you can see, Dr. Zucker has a very active Facebook page with a lot of useful info. So don't, don't forget to follow him. Also, we will have a blog post uh, written by me and reviewed by Dr. Zucker uh, reviewing this, uh, this specific webinar. And we have also two other blog posts already on osmosis. Uh, okay, so the questions. First question is, how to provide a safe environment for LGBTQ plus patients, especially in certain countries that are not as accepting? Yeah, so as I told you at the beginning, uh, there are small symbols that can actually make it happen. But I do understand that there are places like the United Arabs or other places where putting the, you know, uh, putting LGBTQ flag in the middle of your clinic might be kind of a problem. And that's why you have to be very sensitive also to the culture of the place and, and kind of like to adapt it. And sometimes these things need to be, you know, if it's an open place, just putting this you know, um, flag or something which will be symbolic that you can talk openly about uh, uh, things will be great. But if not, you kind of like need to need to um, address the patient on a personal level. And if you feel um, here, there's a lot of psychological involved, psych, psych involved, like, like, I mean, the way to approach it and not to make the patient, you know, fear from you or just like getting very nervous from you. And this is something you learn during the time of being kind of a provider who wants to provide. Uh, and I'm doing mistakes all the time, by the way, too. This is how we operate because sometimes, you know, you think you're doing things on the right way, but it also, you, there's always the other side. So it, you have to be very, um, you know, delicate with this thing. Um, and culture is very important here, for sure. Uh, the next question is similar, but also different. It's about um, making patients feel comfortable talking about uh, their use of recreational drugs. So first of all, uh, what I'm doing is I just don't make it a big issue. So sometimes... Uh, first of all, if the patient is willing to actually tell by himself that he is doing drugs, like I said, you shouldn't kind of like tell him, okay, you're doing drugs, you know, that's bad, right? And, and kind of like say, so you should stop taking it. This is not imp imp improper, you know, because this is a losing or like you, you really missed an opportunity. Now, if you just, he tells you, I'm taking G or I'm taking MDMA. I took MDMA. I felt not so well later on. The main thing is actually to discuss about it. How did you do it? Why did you do it? What, like, why did you mix it with? But for that, you will have to know more about these drugs because if it will give you answers for like answers, you don't know what to do with. It's also a problem, right? So it's something you have to study as a provider also uh, about like what are the different drugs and, and their interactions, etc. You should remember also that if you are asking, sometimes you have to ask it because this is in your marks, do you use drugs? And the patient do tell you use drugs, just use it as the first thing to kind of like open a discussion instead of like just putting a mark on it and move on. Okay. Um... Next question is, uh, when interpreting lab values for a transgender patient, do we refer to the baselines for their biological sex or for their gender expression? So we refer to the gender expression, of course. So um, for example, the estrogen level, this is how you actually align, align with your gender. So um, 
we are trying to bring, for example, transgender women to a levels of a woman and a transgender to an estrogen level of a woman and a transgender man to a, to a testosterone level of a man. So, uh, so yeah, according to the sex you want to be in or the gender you want to be. Awesome. Um, next question is if there is, if there's any statistics or research, uh, to back up the prevalence of, um, disparities in these communities. So first of all, there will be the blog post, so we'll add some info there. Uh, but is there any maybe resource you can recommend for people to look at or any like medical, uh, websites? Yeah, so there are a lot of uh, research done about it, about disparities, about drug use that happens more in the LGBT community, about, uh, you know, HIV, U equals U, all those things. Um, and I think, I don't know if you know, but there is a big organization called GLEMA. Uh, the, it's the Gay Lesbian Medical Association. Um, and they have a website and they have a yearly also conference and where they present all kind of data. And I think in this website, you can find a lot of knowledge about those areas, but it's also available in a lot of other places too. It's kind of like all over. Okay, we have a lot of questions. So we'll do, I think, last three questions. Uh, anything else you have, you can always uh, send us to Osmosis or follow Dr. Zucker's uh, Facebook page, which there's a lot of information there. Um, so for people who are interested in pursuing um, this kind of special speciality, do you have any tips? So it's a, I'll make the real long story short, but uh, this, my fellowship started really funny because I was here just doing my observership for one month in an HIV clinic. Um, in, in Mount Sinai, and it became kind of like from an idea that I had went through the president of Mount Sinai, David Rich, and uh, we created this program, and Sinai created this program, which is now just starting, and this is kind of like a unique program that does not exist, uh, so, so I hope that when year goes by, there will be more and more people who will be exactly those ambassadors for LGBT medicine, which, again, I'm saying they are not supposed to be kind of like the replacement for primary care providers who are taking care of LGBT people and should know the basic stuff, but more of kind of like the next step in case things get wrong or things get complicated. And um, for now, I think like when year will go by, um, there will be more and more of those programs for sure. Um, I'm almost certain. All right, thank you. And if you could elaborate a bit more about the uh, party keepers and if you are doing or will this be also outside of Israel? Yeah, so party keepers, actually, it's funny that you ask it because just before this call, I had a call. So we are doing the first party keeper course in New York, actually, with the biggest gay scene parties before Pride here on the 25th of June. So we are going to do the first course here. And I'm really excited about it because it's a project that started from an idea and we, it kind of like became bigger and bigger. And I can share with you, I will send Omer um, the study and the research we did about it also with the materials and stuff when, we, when it will get published hopefully soon and you can read about it. Um, yeah, for in, from what I see, it's supposed to be because when I looked for it, there was nothing like that going on anywhere. And I think it can be implemented easily in other places, not just for the LGBTQ community, if you think about it, it's totally for everyone, for every party goers who are doing drugs. That's really amazing, I think. Um, okay, and last question. Um, could you give any recommendations about what uh, we as medical students can do to raise awareness about these topics since in most of our universities, these topics are not uh, actually covered. Yeah, so, so actually in Israel, at least now, they opened 
really a community of LGBTQ uh, association in the students, um, you know, of the students, of the medical students from the different fields. And I think kind of like creating those groups who are actually taking as an effort towards the university to kind of create uh, a programs and more lectures about it, talking more about it will make also the universities themselves to be more aware that it needs to be implemented also as part of the curriculum of, you know, right from the beginning, from first year to second year to the clinical years. And, and I think it should be kind of, you know, um, you can do something about it by just doing, you know, and creating something and just think about it. Oh, let's create this group of people who are pro LGBT. They don't, they don't have to be, by the way, LGBTQ themselves. They just want to kind of like address the situation and the problems uh, and, and kind of like create a thing. And I think I, I'm always into creating new things as you might see. So just do that. Just do. <laughs> I think that's an excellent tip. So that's all the time we have. I want to thank everyone again for attending and a very, very big thank you, Dr. Zucker, for your time and effort and for this uh, really great uh, presentation. Thank uh, you. So thank you for having me. It was a pleasure and I hope you learned a lot and, and stay safe. <laughs> yeah. So thank you everyone and have a good day. Bye. Bye-bye.